Welcome back to another episode of the Pitch BTCC show. I'm joined here by Dan Lloyd, who's just had a fantastic weekend at Silverstone. But we're going to have a chat with him and find out exactly how he's made his way back onto the British touring car grid. Dan, how was your weekend? Hi, Sean. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, nice to be on the show. Thanks for inviting me on. Uh, a bit upset you waited this long <laughs> <laughs> to the season. <laughs> well, you should have got better results earlier in the season. Where were you when I was finishing 15th? I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, fantastic weekend. Um, absolutely over the moon, obviously. It's, um, we're filming this on Tuesday and I'm, I'm still buzzing. Still really, really happy. We needed that result. Well, what's, what's interesting, I mean, again, we, we've got, normally we have you in the studio, but obviously you, you live up in the grim north, so it's miles and miles and miles away. But you've got, other than that, you've got a real reason, because you injured your back over the weekend, and this morning you were in agony. You've been off to the, the sports massage guy. What was her name? <laughs> <laughs> her uh, name obviously... Sir, Sir Raj, so that's a bit worrying. <laughs> no, no. He's... But, but how, how's the, how is the back after the weekend? Um, I mean, it, I've been suffering with a bad back for about 18 months now. Um, it's been a really long process, but long story short, I've got, um, I've got a bulging disc, which is nipping on my sciatic nerve. Um, and I mean, I've had bloods done, MRIs, x-rays. Um, I'm on the list to get an injection in my spine. Um, it's caused me so much pain over winter. Um, I mean, it's, so much pain I suffer from insomnia. I've been to done sleep clinics. Uh, me and my girlfriend didn't sleep in the same bed for six months because I, I couldn't sleep. Um, so it's been a really long process, to be honest. So yeah. something I'm really trying to put up with. But um, over the last sort of three or four months, I've really made some progress with the with the physio and the rehab. Um, and but. Unfortunately, after Croft, Monday morning, it, it gave way. Something let go and it's trapped my sciatic nerve again. Right, right. Well, let's, let's hope that, that Siraj has done the best and uh, got, got yourself back, in, back on form because it's a couple of weeks until we go to Donington. But going back a little bit, it was interesting. We had a chat before the programme. I think you're the person with the, the sort of the most squeezed into a, a, a shorter career, if you like, because you've raced lots of stuff from karting through to the, the VW Cup series, uh, so as in the Scirocco Cup, Porsches, TCR, GTs, British touring cars. The list is slightly endless, but always at a good level. I was really impressed. Tell us a little bit about how your career started. Yeah, I mean, you're right there. I've, I've, I've done a lot of things and um, obviously I'll, we'll get into why. But for me, budget's always been an issue and it's something we've really had to work hard against. So, I mean, I, I started karting when I was 11 years old. Um, originally, the, the, the reason why I started karting, when I was about nine, my, my dad suffered with a, with a brain tumour. Um, quite quite a severe one and they spent a couple of years recovering and not spending a lot of time with each other so when he I mean he's absolutely fine now um, but when he when he finally got better we wanted to spend some time together and do something and uh, we, we tried golf football this that and the other they sound wanted... a lot cheaper than motorsport yeah it, I bet he wishes that you'd taken up golf yeah he, he, um, he still regrets the fact of <laughs> having to go <call> golf karting <laughs> Um, so we went indoor go karting and um, we had a lot of fun. I, I was really good at it and ended up breaking lap records quite quickly. And um, there was one day and my dad runs a, a print a mailing distribution business and um, a guy came in to sell him some uh, telecom communications at telephone systems and it was Oliver Rowland's dad, uh, Dave Rowland. Um, so that's Oliver Rowland. He's the Formula E racer at the moment, isn't he? Fol that's right. That's right. So, I mean, uh, Dave Rowland, I mean, he's passed away now, but, you know, he's a great guy. And he came along and he said, oh, my, my son, he was British champion at the time, Oliver. Um, and he said, you know, if, if you get this uh, telephone system off me, then I'll, I'll take you guys down to PFI. I'll give you a proper day's testing in a car. So my dad did it, got the, got the telephone systems, and then that sort of stepped us up from indoor karting to outdoor karting. 
Um, so yeah, Oliver helped me early on in my career, giving me tips and mechanicing some weekends and things like that, and just progress from there. I, I love these stories in motorsport. There's always some connections of people that sort of you work with earlier on and then they move on to different things or you move on to different things. And it, I, I, that's what, for me, makes motorsport really interesting is all the personalities involved and where they end up. But then after karting, what did you then, what's your next step on to the, the bigger circuits after that? Yeah, I mean, just to touch on what you just said then, it is, is really interesting because we got involved with, Ollie, and at the time when he was helping me and doing some mechanicing for me, yeah, at the time he was tipped off to be the the next Formula One driver. I mean, he never quite got there. I mean, I was circumstantial, but um, like to get to Formula E, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, after after go karting, when I was fifteen, I won a BRDC scholarship through Stars of Tomorrow um to win a Ginetta Junior Championship. So we went to Silverstone for a shootout. Um I'm trying to think who was there at the time. God can't remember. Um but anyway we we won the shootout and that was amazing because it gave us a stepping stone into cars. And that was the first year Ginetta Juniors was on the Toka package. Um I did that back then that was that was a H pattern gearbox with a clutch and that's why I a heel and toe. That's I'm still a right foot breaker now because of that. I went from karting to heel and towing. I've never switched back. But it's incredible how many people have come from Ginetta Juniors. I mean, they they do a fantastic job of introducing people to motorsport, but then giving them a ladder to move on further up into the sport. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I'd um, I'd a driver the weekend a guest, and it was a um, it was a lad who did karting. I think it was at Croft actually. And he said, have you got any tips? And my tip was, don't hang on in karting for too long. Mm -hmm. Get into cars. And, you know, that's what Junior Jeanette is a, a mega for because it gives you a platform to jump up nice and early. So then after Ginetta Juniors, we sort of run through, because we, we could be here all day going through all the different cars and championships you've raced in, because it's almost it's almost endless. But then you, you did, uh, was it Scirocco R's? Sirocco Cup in, in supporting the DTM? Is that, is that well? I, yeah, to, so I did Ginetta Juniors yeah. and then I did Cleo Cup, which ah, was yeah, on the yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Toka package. Uh, managed to win the Winter Series there. And then I, I won a, another scholarship to go and race in Sirocco R Cup in Germany, which was a fantastic championship because it was a support package to um, DTM. And it was highly subsidised by VW at the time, uh, which was absolutely amazing. At the end of that year, I think I, I finished second in the championship. And that's the year when I won the scholarship uh, for Porsche Carrera Cup. Um, so again, went along to Silverstone. And we, it's quite an intense assessment, uh, that one. And um, I, did, I did Porsche Carrera Cup for two years. Um, I, was the first scholar to win a race in the first year and that's when they extended it for a second year so that, that was incredible um quite an interesting story actually at the end of that second year that's when they were doing the international Porsche scholarship so the Porsche Super Cup the one that follows the F1 um I got invited to that so every Carrera Cup around the world would invite a driver from their championship to go do uh, a shootout so there were about 12 drivers at Oschersleben in Germany. And um, we did two days. We had six new sets of tyres. There were four different Porsche cars. We had an engineer each. Like they chucked Wow, a lot they don't muck about. Things. I mean, I do the commentary for the Porsche Super Cup now, and, and they really do support the drivers and try and bring the young guys on. So it's, it's great to see. 100%. I mean, they, they, they hired the track uh, exclusively for two days, and that's all, that's all it was for. At the end of the two days, we did a qualifying run and a race run and out of the 12 drivers there was me and another driver who were half a second up the road more than everyone else and in qualifying he was a tenth quicker than me in the race run I was about one and a half tenths quicker than him and um, it was it, it was Earl Bamber oh blimey right yeah yeah and they were supposed to give us a decision in a week or two and it went three weeks four weeks and still no decision he did the last round of the Super Cup that year in Abu Dhabi, put it on pole, came second, fastest lap of the race, and then he got he got given the prize. So I think looking back at my career, where I think 
what was you know the the close point of making it on a big scale in GTs was was missing out on that uh, Super Cup. Uh, scholarship. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's sliding doors, about, isn't it? Yeah, no. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you can't think about it. It's gone. It's gone, isn't it? So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting looking back what I did. And then I tried to stick it out in the GT world, uh, but because budget was always an issue, I never got in the best teams. You need to be in a proper factory driven team in GT worlds to stand out. You know, I did um, Blanc Pan Endurance Series one year where there's 60 cars in it, three drivers per car. You know, you think how special you need to be to stand out in that field. Um, so, yeah, it, it was tough. So then you, after GTs, you, you, in amongst that, you, had, you, you made your touring car, British touring car debut in 2010. I think you were on the same grid as me, actually, because you were in the Vectra and I was in my little Golf at the back of the grid. So you, you probably didn't notice I was there. Um, but the, uh, but that's, that's where you started in touring cars. And then you've, had, you've dipped in and out, had some great results, which, you know, it's, it's been a... You know, it's really shown your pace, but it's always been a struggle getting the budget to to stay in the field. But I mean, I suppose skipping through a few years because you had some great years and some fantastic results in TCR as well, which is 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 interesting. We'll we sort of discuss later in the program the, the sort of the differences between a TCR car and a British touring car. But now you're you're back in touring cars. You've done a full season in the series for the first time. You've just had your best weekend in the series ever at Silverstone with the Powermax Racing Vauxhall Astra. So it looks fantastic. So we'll chat to you more and let you know and see how we'll chat over the, the weekends at Croft, which wasn't quite so good. Weekends at Silverstone, which was fantastic. But see you after the break and we'll be having a chat with Dan and we'll also have Matt Salisbury here to chat through exactly what happened at Silverstone and at Croft the week previously. Welcome back to the Pitch BTCC show. I'm joined by Dan Lloyd, who's had a fantastic weekend at Silverstone, but also joined by Matt Salisbury for an inside BTCC. We're going to be talking about what happened the week before at Croft, which wasn't quite so good for you, Dan, was it? I mean, the weekend at Croft really is completely different to what's just happened at Silverstone. But sort of run through your weekend for us. Yeah, so at Croft, um, tough weekend, tough Tough weekend for the team. Um, it was looking positive at one point in, in qualifying with six minutes to go. I was I was P3 uh, and then everyone just kept going quicker and ended up P14. Um, race one made some made some good good progress, went from 14th to 9th and uh, chose the optional tyre for race two. But unfortunately, we got hit quite heavily on the first lap, uh, which caused quite a bit of damage to the car and the setup. Um, so it just kept pushing me back and back and back into more trouble. Um, so I ended up starting the third race in, in 17th and unfortunately got collected from two other cars making contact at the first corner, which put me in the gravel. So um, what was looking like a could have been a really positive day, getting in that reverse grid in race two, which I think would have been definitely possible given the pace that we had. Um, it, it was kind of a day that what, what could have been well, it's a shame because Croft's, you know, been the highlights of one of the highlight circuits of your career because obviously you made your debut back in 2010 in the British Touring Car Championship there. You've also had race wins. You've been on the front row. Last year you got taken off again, which is that sort of outside line at the first corner. But let's have a look back at the highlights from Croft and see how it panned out for Dan, but also who were the winners and who were the losers on the grid that weekend. Lights out in his blast off, a good start by Moffat. Good start also by Tom Oliver as the cars accelerate down towards Clermont Corner for the first time. Moffat it is, he's got the best start and Jake Hill's trying to find a way into the pack. He's hung out to dry on the outside. Turkington gets up alongside him. They are still side by side and Jake Hill has done it. Round the outside line to go second, that's a good pass. Somebody's demolished one of the markers already as bits fly, but it is Aidan Moffat who knees up to the chicane. And and this is on board with Cook down the inside at Sunny. This is the fifth and he's gone through. Good move. Great move. But there, Ronnie Jackson gets turned around. I fear that was Dan Robotham getting involved with him, so that's going to delay the Honda. It was a frustrating qualifying. It's become a really bad first race. 
Hill has to go to the inside, but again, Aiden Boffin covers that off. Hill tickles the back of the Infinity. Now the rear wheel drive will storm away, and Aiden Boffin is going to win race one of the weekend at Croft. It is a fourth career win. Aiden Boffin wins. Second over the line, Jake Hill. Third is Senna Proctor, then it's Turkey to Cook and Sutton to round out the top second. Aiden Boffin launches away from pole position. So does Colin Turkey too, who makes a really good start then from row two. Tom Ingram dives to the inside to block Stephen Janney, but he's side by side for the race lead. Moffat to the inside, Turkington tries to get between Moffat and Hill into turn one. Moffat goes wide, but he's going to be the outside line for Jake Hill for the first part of the complex. It'll be the inside line for the next corner coming up now. Son of Proctor's trying to buy into this, and so is Josh Cook. Cook dives through as well, but Jake Hill has done it. Yes, he leads, and that is Tom Chilton in stride for the complex, and so also Rory Butcher off the road, and that's a damaged Toyota. Chicane. And a rather smoky BMW is in stride there. That's off the road, looks like being Tom Oliphant's car and Cook off Proctor and he's finally done it. Goes through, goes third and Turkington tries to squeeze by as well. Good defence by Proctor, cover that move off. But look at Sutton now. Ash Sutton comes up against Turkington, he's going to go through. Yeah, he's going to go around the outside here. Oh, oh no! Oh, great late break by Turkington, forces him out. Here comes Shedden up the inside line, Turkington gets forced out wide. Ingram attacks, so also does Sutton. Proctor goes ahead of Turkington. Morgan's in the mix as well. Turkington is tumbling down the order. Sutton's gone back ahead. This is a proper race win. Up to the line, the MB Motorsport Ford Focus in the hands of Jake Hill wins at Croft. Jake Hill, the winner for the second time in his career, second after a great drive, Aidan Moffat, and then Josh Cook takes third, Tom Ingram fourth, Ash Sutton for fifth, sixth quarter shed, and lights go red. Round 21 of the championship is go. Good start by Turkington, good start by Sutton, good start by Jelly. They accelerate down towards Clairvaux Corner for the first time. Gordon Shedden tries to come up alongside Turkington. It's brave, but Sutton's under attack from Cook, so Turkington leads. Shedden goes second. There's a sideways Astor in the middle of the pack, and off the road has gone Dan Lloyd, and there's mayhem. Jade Edwards is involved in it. Oliphant is off the road as well. Uh, Jack Goff has picked up big damage. That's Mick Halstead, who is off the road. Hill, a oh. big, big off for Jason Plato, coming down towards Sunny, and he is off the road. Change of direction. Oh! Oh! Well, that was Jelly and Robottom getting together, and they've been delayed. I think that was partly Jelly checking up to avoid the slowing cars that were avoiding a spinning. The hairpin, Chilton gets into the side of Osborne. Rory Butcher gets collected. He's on the outside. There's damage. Oh, dear. Let's see. Osborne is delayed as Butcher escaped. The King of Croft reigns supreme. A 13th Croft win for Colin Turkington. Checkered flag is waved. Colin Turkington wins. Gordon Shedden is just going to hang on to second, but only just as Ash Sutton tries to get up alongside him. The gap of the flag, 0.216 of a second between Shedden and Sutton. Tom Ingram takes fourth ahead of Josh Cook. At sixth will be Aidan Moffat as he accelerates towards the line. So a typical rough and tumble weekend at Croft there with lots of lots of winners, lots of losers. Aidan Moffat had a fantastic weekend. Jake Hill had a great weekend as well. But that guy Ash Sutton still keeps getting the points on the board. I mean, that's the tricky thing, isn't it? So Matt, you're, you're the man with all the stats from Croft. What did you find that caught your eye? Well, there were a few interesting little things that came away from the weekend. I mean, Dan kind of said what a difficult weekend it had been for him, but two of those guys who won races over the course of the Croft meeting, Aidan Moffat and Jake Hill, certainly had reason to celebrate. Both of them were winning at Croft for the first time. For Aidan, it was his first win in rear-wheel drive, first win since 2018, first time he'd led a lap, first time he'd put the car on pole position. So really, he had a weekend to celebrate. And, and Jake, that first win for MB Motorsport, it's possibly been longer in coming than the team was hoping for. I think, you know, you'll probably admit that you hoped last season the Honda would have taken a win and didn't quite manage it. So it was good for him to get that monkey off his back and get that victory that helped him move up the championship standings. And then in race three, Colin Turkington won. Colin Turkington always wins when we go to Croft because that was win number 13 for him. But it was good that he did it in the final race of the weekend because it was the 700th race in the championship for WSR. So nice to celebrate a landmark with a victory and it was a win that also means BMW now have more wins than any other manufacturer at Croft. They were level with Honda. One of those Honda wins was of course the win that Dan scored but BMW are now out in front by themselves. Well it's interesting because you've got 
Ash Sutton, who sort of did a, the job that Colin Turkington's known to do, which is just rack up the points quietly under the radar. And his teammate, Aidan Moffat, helped the team, the Laser Tools racing team, with the, the overall teams championship as well. But it was good to see Colin back up, winning races and looking really competitive. I mean, Dan, your weekend, again, wasn't great there. And, and what, what was the biggest problem, do you think, compared to some of the other cars? Because it's, it's said it's, it's a real-wheel drive circuit, and we've been talking about this all year. And the circuits don't seem to be... The circuits don't seem to know what we're talking about because it always seems to be slightly different. But, I mean, they resurfaced it a few years ago, and that's definitely changed what sort of chassis makeup works best there. Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the rear wheel drive cars certainly still work there very well. Um, one struggle that we're having a bit as a team this year in general, our car isn't fantastic over the curbs. Um, it certainly makes a difference at Croft just when you're hitting these curbs. They're not the biggest ones, but they're under the traction area. So when you just clip one and it doesn't take it too well, then it can push the front end into traction understeer. Uh, which makes a, a massive difference around Croft. Right, yeah. I mean, then, then, then going back after that, I mean, do you think that, that the guys who are sort of at the, fight, the, the front of the championship, do you think they've got a chance of beating Ash Sutton this year? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's all to play for. You know, there, there are six races left. I think someone said it on ITV the weekend, you know, one bad race in race one you know, and a solid weekend from someone else. I think it's, I think it's wide open still. I mean, everyone knows that anything can happen in this championship, but fair play, fair play to Ash, you know, he's been so consistent this year and to keep that lead all this way, I mean, it'll be tough for someone to beat him. Yeah, I think he's driving fantastically well. And also, he sort of picks his battles a little bit more than maybe he used to before. But Matt, what else have you got from us from Croft? Just picking up on what uh, what you guys were saying there about Ash this season, I think it's interesting to see the approach he's taken to his racing. If you compare Croft this season to what happened at Croft last season, two very different Ash Suttons. Last year, he made that move on Jake at the hairpin that he admitted afterwards was a bit rash. And, you know, the points he lost there because of the puncture could have ended up costing him the championship when we got to the business end of the season. So the ash that we're seeing now is is more reserved. I spoke to him at the end of the weekend at, at Silverstone um, and he said, you know, I'm taking a different approach and there are times in the car when I almost have to say to myself, do I need to go for that one? And, and instead of it being, I want to be on the podium, I want to be on the podium, I want to win the race, there's that little bit of him is thinking, I want the points. I need the points. It's the points that are going to matter when we get to the end of the season. And I think that's why in recent events, he maybe hasn't stuck his nose down the inside, whereas he would have done, you know, last season or, or the season before. And that consistency is what's going to be key because the championship's going to ebb and flow. You know, in race one and two, he might get outscored by Tom Ingram or by Colin Turkington. But then all of a sudden in the reverse grid race, Ash is starting ahead of them. He gets a big score. They're struggling a bit with weight. And we end up coming out of a weekend with the difference between them at the front only being one or two points rather than someone suddenly gaining 10 or 15. It might come down to the fact that Ash needs a bad race, but with six to go, it could very much happen. Well, that's the interesting thing, isn't it, with, with, with Ash Sutton, because his strength can also be his weakness because he's a natural racer. He's a bit like a shark, really. You know, he sees something and he goes for it. And now I see that he's, he's holding himself back a bit. So from your point of view, Dan, you've won championships in, in, in various things. How difficult is it then to hold back your natural aggression just to score points rather than just going for every, every place you can get? Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I think with Ash, he's probably, because he's now, you know, been a bit more relaxed and not as aggressive, he's actually seen the benefits as well. You know, I can see on social media how much praise he gets for, you know, for being the point collector now. So he probably likes it in, in that sense. But in another, another way, in this championship, sometimes the less aggressive you are, the more trouble you get into. Um, sometimes when you hesitate and you don't go for the move, that can back you up into more issues as well. So it's such a fine line as well. Well, definitely. So moving on from Croft, we're now going to have a look at Silverstone. So join us after the break and we'll see what difference a week makes in British touring cars. Mm. 
Welcome back to the Pitch BTCC show. I'm joined by British touring car driver Dan Lloyd, who had a fantastic weekend at Silverstone, and also Matt Salisbury, who also had a fantastic weekend from Silverstone, doing his behind the scenes stats job for Inside BTCC. Let's have a look at the highlights from Silverstone and see what went on. It's Rory Butcher on pole, it's go. He gets away nicely, there's the wet patch, he's clear of it, but how many places have that cost him? He's lost the lead, that's for sure, so Tom Ingram hits the front, and Rory Butcher is second. It could have been a whole lot worse then. It's Sutton going through, now it's Moffat going through in third place, ahead of Josh Cook, and now the Carls make the run up towards Beckett for the first time. We've got Drama in the background, is that Osborne or Neat that's gone out wide, and a Morgan involved in that as well. To another more mayhem, which involves Gordon Shedden and Sam Smelt. Gordon Shedden sees and goes from bad to worse. As Rory Butcher dives for the race lead coming into Brooklyn's fantastic moving from gave him the space and Rory Butcher needed no second invitation get the inside line breaks a fraction later box ticked place taken Sutton goes so now Butel's got down the inside Jones gonna try and follow through as well good move by Butel and Rory Butcher is gonna have a second victory of the season the Toyota Gazoo Racing UK Corolla wins at Silverstone Rory Butcher wins Tommy Grimm is second, third Dan Lloyd, best of the season, fourth Aidan Moffat, then it's Cook, Turkington, Sutton, Robo like to go out in his blast off, good getaway by those from the front, not a great start by Dan Lloyd, and he's in danger of losing out to Josh Cook, he has lost out to Josh Cook and others on the run towards Cox, Butcher maintains the advantage then as they round Cox corner for the first time, he's got Tom Ingram all over him like a rash, Cook goes third, and then fourth is Aidan Moffat as they head towards Beckett's. Nick Hamilton is off. Can he get the job done? It's like a rolling start, isn't it? They're still side by side, but as they get to Beckett's, the place should be Ingram's on the inside line, and now Cook has left the door open in a sense for Moffat. Yeah, Moffat and Turkington try to buy into that. That took three corners to do that path. And off the road is Jade Edwards. But Ingram breaks as late as he dares, but Cook does secure second place then. So Josh Cook goes through. 39 kilos versus 66. Moffat is in the mix. Turkington is in the mix. Sutton is in the mix. One overtake further up the road. But Pat Concertina's look. Robottom has joined the party as well. Aidan breaks as late as he dares. Absolutely side by side, those two. And this is a proper attack from Turkington because he's got the track position for the next corner and he's done the move. And he thinks he thinks he commits. He gets up the inside. He's off the road. Goes straight on. Locks up. Goes wide. It was worth a go. He's filled the front with grass. And Rory Butcher gets the race lead back. Well, Josh Cook had a go. Relatively speaking, he had nothing to lose, such was the gap over the opposition. And so it is going to be a second win of the day for Rory Butcher with 75 kilos of weight on board. Race two, check and flag. Rory Butcher wins. Great try. Second, Josh Cook, who threw everything at it. Ingram is third, Turkington fourth, and fifth. Sutton. As you can see, the right height roller uh, not fitting under the front of the car. Question marks were raised at the time. I think Josh Cook said that there, were, there was grass obstructing the roller or something like that. But anyway, the decision was taken to exclude Josh from the results. As a result uh, of that, also the, uh, the reverse grid draw was also revised. And we've got Daniel Lloyd uh, on pole position instead of his teammate, Jason Plato. But it's an all-power maxed racing uh, Vauxhall front row with Jake Hill and Steve and Jelly on road two. Lights go out now, it is blast off, and a good start made from fourth on the grid by Stephen Jelly. Gordon Shedden stalls on the grid, he's away late. Everybody dodged around him, but Gordon's day goes from bad to worse, and through Cops corner, Jason Plato losing spots there, but he's down to fourth already. It is Lloyd leading, Jake Hill second, up to third has gone Stephen Jelly, Chris Smiley is fifth behind Plato, and then you've got Moffat, Sutton, Robotter and Ingram all in the mix. The driver there, look, because that is Sam Osborne off the road, and who's the other one? That is one of the car gods, BMWs, it's Tom Chilton. And there, look, to the inside line, Stephen Jelly ahead of Ash Sutton. Now, Ash was briefly ahead, but Stephen Jelly goes back through. Ash Sutton to the outside line. This should give Jake Hill the race lead again. The mirror's almost touched there as they head into the right hander, but Hill does it. He goes through on the inside line. So Jake Hill leads at Silverstone. He's got the inside line, side by side into Cox, but it's the Infinity ahead as they come out of the corner. This is Sutton on the move and on the grass as well, and he found some traction on pit exit, and he's in exactly the right place for Beckett. He's on the inside line, and Sutton goes third. Brave stuff. Jake Hill, after a bad start to the weekend, rounds it out in style. Jake Hill wins, race three at Silverstone, second goes to Dan Lloyd. Ash Sutton finishes third, and then the freight train to fourth. It's Smiley, Jelly, Plato, Moffat, Turkington, Robot. 
So as always, the Silverstone National Circuit was a fantastic arena for motorsport, especially when the British touring cars are racing round Northamptonshire. But one of the incidents that I saw was the incident, did Rory Butcher overtake under yellow flags in that first race against Tom Ingram? Definitely Tom Ingram thought so, looking at the interviews afterwards. But I mean, we've got a video that we can show now, which shows that actually the yellow flag came in just before Rory got there. I've got to say, I think he was a very lucky boy because I think another half a second later and he'd have been overtaking under yellows but how did you see that Dan? Yeah I mean obviously I was following them both at the time I had quite a good view going into Brooklyn's the lap before there were double yellow flags um, and then going into into the corner obviously Rory made the move and at the time I was thinking oh god he's gonna get done for that or He's going to at least give the place back a lap later. And it went on and on and on. I thought it's a bit of a weird decision not to give the place back. Um, obviously, there's the video showing it came in. But, you know, from inside the car, it looked like the move was made when the yellow flags were out. He decided to make the move. And, you know, I, I like Rory. I got on really well with Rory. But if I was Tom, I, I would have been fuming as well, to be honest. No, exactly. I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I suppose the thing is, from the steward's point of view, which is why it's always difficult with these decisions because you don't see all the angles, but you can't be done. It's, it's a little bit like the safety board's coming out. Until you're actually passing the safety car board, you can actually overtake. I mean, I remember Matt... Matt Jackson doing it a few years ago at Thruxton where he carried on racing. Everybody else backed off and he, he nicked a place under the safety car, which they all argued about. But, but I totally agree with you. Yellow flags, especially waved it, well, any yellow flag, really, it's a no overtaking zone. I think Roy just didn't see the flag because he was unaware it afterwards because he was probably in the blind spot behind Tom's high own dive. But, you know, there you go, he's racing. He got the luck of the draw this time, but, uh, you know, I'm sure he'll be looking out next time. But going back to the racing, you had a stellar weekend. I mean, what was the difference between Croft as a circuit and Silverstone which suddenly made your Vauxhall Astra come alive? Yeah we had an amazing weekend um, still on a high from it uh, to be honest and um, we struggled at Croft for a few reasons uh, one of them being it's, I mean it's not no secret we've struggled a bit this season as a team and um, one of the parts where we're struggling is we can't ride the curbs as well as other cars can uh, so obviously that doesn't affect us as much at Silverstone as it as it did somewhere like Croft. Um, so that's definitely a, a big reason. Um, the other thing is is just a bit of lady luck as well. To be honest, Croft could have been quite easily been very very different for us. Uh, we could have been in that reverse grid, but I mean for sure, you know, qualifying fifth and getting up to third on the first race out of merit. Um, yeah, it, it was mega, and we were just tweaking the car. We're still not where we want to be. Obviously, we're light. We haven't got weight in the car, so there's no, I'm not under any illusion that you know that's raw pace. You know, we're, we're good because we haven't got the weight, but we are making improvements as well. Oh, it's so, so close on the grid, literally thousands of a second between cars. It, it makes it really, really hard once you're out there racing because once you have somebody go past you, you can easily get shuffled back. But you did a fantastic job of that. But Matt, I mean, what else did you see from when you were looking, scurrying around in the paddock at British Touring Cars? What sort of information did you find for us? Well, just going on something Dan said there about the fact he qualified fifth on the grid, I think that played a big part in in how his weekend panned out. He hadn't qualified above eighth going into the race meeting at Silverstone. And if you look at the qualifying averages for him and, and for Jason, they're right next to each other. But, you know, you're looking at an average of, of 12th or 13th on the grid. And, and when you're in that position, it can get a lot more difficult on race day, especially at a circuit like Silverstone, where it's very slow and you've got the toe and everything to contend with. If you find yourself back in the early teens, you're in trouble because it only takes a tap going through cops for the first time. And, you know, you're spinning off and you're at the back of the grid and, and your race day is ruined. So I think that that extra few places in qualifying was key for Dan. And, you know, it turned up, it led to, sorry, you know, a double podium finish. It's the first time he's done that in the championship. 
probably his best weekend in terms of the points that he scored in the championship, even when you consider that win at, at Croft a few years ago in the Honda. And it also means at the end of the weekend that Dan's now scored more points this season than he's scored in the championship before. And I know that, you know, he hasn't contested a full season before, but, you know, 24 races he's done now, 21 he did in his season in the Honda with Eurotech. So it's a new personal best for him. And that follows on from Jake Hill and Aidan Moffat hitting personal bests at Croft. Well, what's interesting as well is how things can be slightly different. I mean, you had a great race one and race two, but also then you benefited from Josh Cook, who unfortunately failed the ride height test, which is, you know, is part of, of the whole championship side of things. And I know everybody has a, has, a, has a chat about that, but I mean, the, the, the steward's decision is final and, and that's where you get unless you want to take it further than that. But actually think how different it could have been if you'd have been still back in 11th place, 12th place on the grid, depending on whether Josh was there or not, that would have made your race three completely different. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, go back to Croft in, in that second race, I started P9 and I easily had the pace to move up, up a couple of positions with the faster optional tyre. If I'd made two places, I would have been on pole for race three at Croft. Uh, but, you know, one small thing, um, like the damage on the first lap can just quickly change your weekend completely. So um, 100% at, at Silverstone, I was... I was fortunate with the position of, of getting Paul. Um, but, you know, 100% very lucky. But I'll take that luck any day of the week because we've had a fair share of uh, bad luck as well. Well, I think I think that's right. I mean, you, I always think in motorsport, you make your own luck, really. Yeah, there's a bit of luck involved, but you've got to be in it to win it. And, then, and as, as Matt was saying, your qualifying is what you know, put you in the mix to, to get stuck in. Whereas if you had a bad qualifying, it's really hard to come through the field. That's the tricky thing. Yeah, I mean, another point, which which what Matt said, qualifying fifth, um, one another issue that we've had throughout the season is the engine overheats uh, quite easily in dirty air. Uh, we haven't quite solved that yet. So when there's a couple of cars in front of you, one, actually, it's OK. But in the second race, when I was eighth or something, in the real dirty air, then it just gradually gets worse and worse. Uh, so that's why I started getting backed up and backed up and falling down. So, um, again, it makes life so much easier when you qualify well. You keep out that little bit of trouble and, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a much nicer weekend. Well, that's the, that's the tricky thing. I mean, the, the Vauxhall is probably one of the, the oldest chassis on the grid now. But really, it's, it's not that old, really. Um, it's it's a, fairly new, but everything's moved on so quickly. So, you know, maybe that's something that over the winter the teams can have a look at because the, the temperatures you get under the engine bay are key to making the car quick, especially when you're talking thousandths of a second. But then going on to the next race after this, we've got Donington Park coming up and the championship's looking really exciting with Ash Sutton slightly having a stranglehold, but as Dan mentioned earlier on, it only takes one error in race one at Donington and then it's all to play for. Welcome back to the Pitch BTCC show. I'm joined by Dan Lloyd, British touring car driver, who's just had a fantastic weekend at Silverstone. And also Matt Salisbury from inside BTCC, who's got all the stats and figures across the whole of the British touring car grid. So we've had two races back to back, which are tricky at Croft and at Silverstone. And the Pitch BTCC users on the Pitch BTC app have voted from those two circuits, their drivers of the day. And the driver of the day from Croft was Aidan Moffat after a stellar performance, really getting hold of that infinity and making it do things that Ash Sutton's normally doing. But also at Silverstone, we had Rory Butcher who won two races and again, turned the corner with that Toyota Corolla. So, I mean, great job by them guys. Hopefully, Dan, now moving on to Donington, we might see you and the Vauxhall Astra. But I mean, you were nearly there. You actually won the vote on social media to be driver of the day from Silverstone. But for the pitch BTCC app users, Rory just about sneaked it. So maybe Donington's going to be your circuit. What's the big difference between somewhere like Croft, Donington and, and uh, Croft, Donington and Silverstone? Yeah, I mean, just to touch on that, I'm really pleased for everyone who, who voted for me. To be honest, I was quite surprised after the weekend and obviously I haven't been up up at the sharp end this year so I was I was I was really pleased that I was getting some votes and people were coming up on social media and saying it so thanks to everyone for that um I mean Donington 
I'm positive. I, I mean, I think Donington's closer to a circuit like Silverstone than Croft. Like I, I mentioned before, we've been struggling with uh, using the kerbs as well as the other cars, which is why it helped us at Silverstone. Donington, we do need to use kerbs, but they're not quite very aggressive kerbs. They're quite soft and smooth, and the where we'd have to take them were quite unloaded on that side. So what about well, you've got the chicane, the chicane, the last quarter. That's a really aggressive kerb on the inside and possibly the outside. But I suppose you're in the air, aren't you? Yeah, not anymore. It's all been flattened. I think I think. What? I think they flattened it because of the, the motorbikes. So it used to be a real, really big sausage curb, didn't it? But now they've, they've, they've flattened it and they put rector cells there. Um, so, I mean, I, I I'm pretty sure that that's the case. So, I yeah. should know that because I drove a Formula 3 car there early in the year, but uh, that's that's more than six, well, three, four months ago. And my brain doesn't remember back that far. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good, so I, re I think your Vauxhall could be really good there. But going back to Silverstone a little bit, Rory had a great weekend, Matt, and I know you've got some information on him. Yeah, I mean, you said they're two wins for Rory. That's the first time in his touring car career that he's done the double and taken two wins in a weekend. It's the first time he's won at Silverstone and then did it again. So it's like buses, they, they come along two at once. Um, it means Speedworks have now got more wins with the Corolla than they had with the Avensis, which is quite an interesting one when you consider how long they ran the old car. The, the Corolla's only been out for a few seasons. Um, and that win, uh, that double win means Toyota have now moved up to eighth on the all-time winners list with 40 wins, moved them ahead of MG and ahead of Renault, who they were, were behind ahead of the weekend. Right, that's interesting. I mean, is, that's it. I didn't know that actually because they did run that event for quite a while. So that's quite impressive that the Corolla has already surpassed their win total. It is, but I think you've also got to bear in mind that everything that they learned from the Avensis and running that for such a long period of time could then be carried over into the Corolla. So they had a much better starting point with the Corolla than the Avensis. They they took a good few years to get a handle on the first car and, you know, no disrespect, but the drivers that they had in the early part of the programme as well weren't Tom Ingram. You know, the likes of Tony Hughes in the first season, Tony was never going to come in and set the world light in British touring cars. And, you know, you need the top line driver, the top line engineer to help develop and drive the car on. So they went from being in a good position with the Avensis to starting off in a much, much better place with the Corolla. And I guess that's just reflected in, in that stat that it's got more wins than the old car already. Well, that's right. Talking about sort of the technical side of racing, Dan, I mean, you've got a huge amount of experience, but in it's sort of saloon cars, but also GTs, but really saloon cars, you've driven a lot of different saloon cars. Um, and what's the big difference? I mean, TCR on the European stage is a big thing, but how does that compare to a British touring car? Yeah, I mean, um, technically, I mean, if, if you look at it from the outside point of view, the, the front wheel drive touring cars, they produce a pretty similar lap time uh, but the the difference between driving them is completely different um the best way i can describe it is it, if, if someone jumps into a tcr car they can feel quite comfortable quite quickly don't get me wrong it's hard to get the last few temps out of it uh, which is where it counts but if people jump in a british touring car it's a really odd feeling uh like with the rear steer and the amount of toe that we have to use to get the car ro rotated I mean, Thruxton going down to Church Corner, 140 miles an hour. It's a right-hand corner, but my steering wheel's going left because you've just got so much rear steer on. It's you, you're backing it up into the corner. So yeah, they're, they're really tricky cars to get a hold of. Well, that's I remember when they first introduced the it was called then the NGTCC rules, which is, it still is. I think, it's, I think I put too many C's on there, but but basically the idea was to make it a real challenge for the drivers, but also a real challenge for the engineers because there's such a myriad of changes you can put together, which is a lot more than other types of saloon car. Yeah, 100%. The really tough cars and, you know, you can be so close to being out the window and obviously it's so close in terms of qualifying. I mean, we mentioned before, I think our average position of qualifying this year has been around 12, 13. But there's been times where I've been P12 and only three tenths off pole. Uh, and if you're a little bit out the window with a setup, that can make all the difference. 
No, definitely. So looking forward to Donington, Matt, I mean, obviously the championship battle's hotting up, but that man Sutton seems to have a slight, maybe one hand on the trophy, I think. But as we said earlier, things can change just in a, in a blink of the eye. But there's a few milestones for a few drivers when we get there. Yeah, well, I mean, Ash is one driver who could hit a landmark this weekend because he's closing in on 50 podiums in the championship. He's up to 49 now. So you'd have to say that unless something goes wrong at Donington, he's got a good chance of reaching that half century. And he's not the only driver who could do it at Donington either because Tom Ingram's up to 48 podiums now. So if he can have a good weekend in the Hyundai, he too could hit a half century. Colin Turkington, so another one of the championship contenders, he needs two podiums to reach 100 in NGTC cars. And he'd be the first person who could hit that mark. And just to show you how impressive that stat is, we only had the 850th podium for an NGTC car this last weekend at Silverstone. So Colin scored quite a lot of them. One other one for Colin's teammate when we get to Donington Park, Stephen Jelly. Race two there will be his 200th, so one to watch. And just to touch on something that you mentioned about the Vauxhall at Donington Park, you said how it could be a good package for Dan. You've got to bear in mind, a few years ago, Josh Cook went to Donington Park with the Astra, stuck it on pole position, and won the opening race. So, you know, the, there's history there. If Dan can do the same, then I'm sure he and the team would be uh, more than happy. Well, definitely. Well, that looks positive for you, Dan. We're just talking about Josh Cook there. He was desperately unlucky because his weekend would have been completely different points-wise from Silverstone without that ride height infringement. And um, But going forwards, it doesn't take too much. He only needs a good result in race one, race two, and he's back in that championship mix, which is actually, there's a gaggle of them. There's, there's Ingram, Hill, Turkington, and then just off the back of them is Josh Cook. Make sure I haven't forgotten anybody else. I won't be on their Christmas card list. But Ash Sutton is looking really strong. I mean, what do you think? Which of those guys, could you pick one of those guys who could be the guy who's, 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 who's sticking it to him when we get to Brands Hatch? I don't know. Like I said, to be honest, I think any of those guys have a good chance. It really is as simple as that. One small mistake or one misfortune in race one for Ash, everyone's going to be jumping on the back of him. You know, Ingram, Hill, it's going to be close. I think it could be like a really good showdown. Or it could be boring for once once in its life and Ash could just keep this keep this break all the way to the end but um, it's not all, it doesn't always go that way well I sort of hope not because I love going to Brands for the last round with it with it all to play for because I mean we saw last year I mean it didn't look like Ash was going to be there to challenge Collington, Colin because he had such a, a strong weekend I think it was it Snetterton before with the series that swapped around because of Covid but he had a fantastic weekend then got to Brands it was raining it was a bit slippery and it, it didn't quite work out for him so it shows how quickly it can change and I think if you just go off what Dan said earlier on about how sometimes when a driver doesn't have to attack quite as much, they can get into trouble. There's always the risk of that happening if Ash was to go to Brands Hatch with a big lead. If, if he goes to Brands Hatch and he's three points ahead of Colin Turkington and six points ahead of Tom Ingram, he's got to push in all three races. He's got no alternative. Otherwise, the guys are going to overhaul him. If he goes to Brands Hatch and he's got a 35-point lead, then there's always that potential that he might think, I've got the points in the bank, I'm OK, and all of a sudden he gets to Paddock Hill Bend, he gets hit in the rear, he's in the gravel, and his lead's disappeared. And if you look back through the years, we have had a few times when we've gone to that final round and a driver's had a big lead and has then had their worst weekend of the season, and, and that gap's come right down, and it's only the fact that they had the buffer in the first place that's let them wrap the title up. So... It's still all to play for, whether he's got a big lead or whether he's got them right with him going to Brands Hatch. It's, it's all to play for, and I wouldn't be surprised if it does go to race two or race three of the final final round. Well, I must say, you've got me all excited there, guys, for a, a real championship showdown. We've got to get through Donington Park first. So thanks very much for joining us on the Pitch BTCC show. Make sure you download the Pitch BTCC app to get involved and you can maybe vote for Dan Lloyd next time to be your driver of the day. Thanks to my guests, Dan Lloyd and Matt Salisbury for joining me. Looking forward to Donington Park. Let's see if any of the guys can get on to Ash Sutton's coattails.